as much as I believe in God, I truly do, I have never found that arguments for God's existence are nearly as effective or as important as arguments for God's necessity. Uh, neither of them are effective uh, in, you know, turning somebody's mind that uh, there is a God. Actual evidence, you know, like physical, hard, hardcore evidence it's the only thing that can turn somebody's mind. <laughs> and, and that's 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 the point that that I want to make here, and we're all making here. No God, chaos. You don't believe in God? At least understand what the consequences mm -hmm, right, of right, that right. non-belief well, are. What's so interesting? Well, if you do not believe in a God, that means what you just believe in chaos, or there's going to be chaos. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, what's interesting about that is we keep having these convert, and the more I, the more that I've been thinking about this in relation to my, you know, forays into the political or cultural world, this is another consequence of how you align the moral with the strategic. And in some ways, what you're saying is, is if you make a moral argument, people don't even know why they think what they think. So to come in and say to them, you need to change your moral outlook. Right, what you're suggesting is, and why I think that's more fruitful, is it's a strategic approach, and that's a way to lead people in, and then they can decide how high up that hierarchy of understanding they want to move. Well, I think it's funny how he, how he claims like people don't know what they believe, and, and, and it's a bunch of religious people talking about religion and trying to decide like who, whose idea of their God and stuff is correct. You can you can look at this purely psychologically, which I like to do as much as possible, because uh, I don't think you should bring God into the issue unless you have to in some sense. Um, you either are aiming for something unified, which means something at the pinnacle and something that's the highest and superordinate and most valuable, or you're not, in which case perhaps you're aiming down, or you're aiming at a multiplicity of diverse things which are conflictual. Those are your options. And we know that if your perception is fragmented and if your navigation is fragmented, which is a chaotic state, the consequence of that is anxiety and despair. Because that's actually what anxiety and despair mark, is that you're, you're confident and secure when, you're, when you've reduced your plethora of potential pathways forward to one path. You know that if you're in a vehicle, it's like, well, are you going one place or 10? If you're going 10, you can't go anywhere and you're confused. You have to. <laughs> he doesn't even understand anxiety and he's supposed to be a clinical psychologist. Uh, no, anxiety isn't because people have a number of options. Anxiety is due to a various chemical imbalances in the brain which causes people to be in a heightened state of awareness to be going one place and then everything snaps together and then your nervous system is literally regulated anxiety is the response to chaos the a priori response i mean to can, chaos. I, can i ask dennis a question in light of that so Dennis, you said earlier that, <clears throat> you, that you need the necessity of God is, is the necessity of belief in God is, is, is what's going to restore us, what's going to keep civilization on the right track. But if uh, the, the, the belief in God is what's going to keep society on the right track. Like, nope. There's many nations that are highly irreligious and their societies are doing fine. Is that, uh, is it enough to have a kind of psychological, just a, a psychological sort of stability, a belief that God uh, might exist or that you should, you should conduct yourself as if mm -hmm. uh, God, God is real, God exists, it's just as a kind of something that, that provides you with a kind of uh, psychological unity and, and stability and order? Or do you think that it's, do you think that a, that a culture needs more than that? Is, is, is a kind of cultural, cultural religion, cultural Judaism, cultural Christianity enough? Well, mine's not cultural. I'm not as nice as cultural is. Uh, but you I, seem to leave open that possibility. Yes, mm -hmm. It's a, I wrestle with that and I have come down to the, I've come to the conclusion that I offered earlier. 
the number of people who believe in God and that God is meaningless is enormous. For most moderns, God is a celestial butler. Uh, this God, here is my list of what I'd like you to do for me. Have a great day. I am, I am uninterested. For, I know this is almost heretical for many of my religious friends. Uh, I have asked God in my whole life twice for something, once that my mother not punish me for breaking the vase in the house, and then once as, as an adult. By the way, in both instances, they were answered. It's a little eerie for me who doesn't ask him for anything. But wow, that's hilarious. He believes that God answered his two prayers, but because I guess he only prayed a couple of times. But in, but in all seriousness, I am infinitely more interested in what God wants for me than what I want from God. And that's that's the way I portray it to, to people. And they're moved by that because they know God is not a celestial butler. The number of, of people who prayed for their dying child and the child died, everybody knows that that's the case. So uh, I, I, I am, oh, I hate to use the term, I'm a, I was going to say tired. Okay, I'm tired of people who say they believe in God, but it doesn't amount to anything. Why is God important? Changes minds. That and and you know the the founders of America, which I think is the greatest country ever founded, and and it may and it may fall over. Uh, we're, we're at a crisis point. They knew the importance. They were not all doctrinaire Christians. They were all, by the way, cultural Christians, clearly. Uh, yeah, some of them were uh, religious, some of them were non-religious, some of them were deists, some of them were Christians. You had uh, some people uh, that were per Puritans, and they even outlawed uh, the celebration of Christmas and being happy because that was somehow bad. Uh, but they were all very God-centered. Uh, when Benjamin Franklin is considered a deist, the, 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 if deist means Aristotle's unmoved mover, none of the founders were deists. They believed in a God who acted in history. Jefferson, this is almost unknown to Americans. Jefferson and Franklin designed a great seal of the United States. You'll find this fascinating. You know what it is? Yeah, and uh, Jefferson also made his own Bible and basically took out like 90% of the Bible and left what he thought was actually correct. Is the Jews leaving Egypt. It was not, tragically, it was not adopted. Two of the least uh, Orthodox Christians, small o, uh, uh, were uh, wanted... The, a biblical depiction to depict America. The, the Hebrews left is, uh, Egypt, we left Europe. Th that, so they knew the importance of God. Funny thing is, like, the story of, like, the Hebrews leaving Egypt is just a fictional story that has been created because there is no evidence of Egypt having uh, a mass exodus of slaves out of their nation and and uh, a lot of believers don't and so i just i'm sorry for talking so long but can i pick up on yes, what Mr. dennis is saying another aspect of the american revolution you probably know that at the um, defeat of george uh, yorktown the hessian and british troops were ordered to play the ballad the world turned upside down which was a 17th century ballad and came out of the English Revolution, which came out of the Torah. And the simple idea was it became various crazy things with the diggers and the levelers and so on. God had created order. Humans had created disorder. So God, to create order again, turned the world the right way up and turned it upside down. And you have in Acts 17, these men who've turned the world upside down have come here, hmm. and so on. So, and the original idea of revolution was actually biblical. Wow, that's hilarious. He's trying to claim that the revolution was biblical when it wasn't. All it was was about uh, the founding fathers not wanting to pay taxes to the king of england so 
they decided to create their own nation, which allowed them to not have to pay taxes. That's all it was. Although today it's almost totally to taken over the by chaos. the left, reordering the world and putting it the right way up. Or again, you just say repairing, That's a revolution. repairing the earth. Yes, repair, repairing the world under the rule of God. Yeah. yeah. So I'm we so we could one say one, that yeah. you could ask the question not so much what do you have with God, you could reverse it in the Nietzschean sense. You could say what do you have without God, mm -hmm. and then what you definitely have is you have no centralizing axis. You have no highest you have no highest spirit in the highest place. And so psychologically, that means chaos and confusion and internal conflict. And then you have no common spirit that unites you. And so then you have conflict. And so I would say that acting as if is the crucial issue. And I was going over that this morning in a class I was doing on the Sermon on the Mount. And Christ says in, in the Sermon on the Mount, the ordering of his ethical injunction is something like, do and then teach, but it's in that order. But it's not do only, and it's not teach only, it's do and then teach. And so you could say you have this internal mimicry of the Father, the Holy Spirit, let's say, the revolutionary spirit in the proper sense, and then you can communicate descriptions of that spirit, and that's the religious enterprise. And we confuse that, I would say, in some sense, with descriptions of external reality. They're not the same thing. The religious enterprise is the description of the animating spirit and the proper animating spirit. And, and that's why even in the Exodus story, God is presented as the spirit that calls the hero to lead his people out of slavery. It's not a description of the world. It isn't that the idea that there's wisdom in the world isn't there, but that's not the superordinate idea. And so I think you need both. You have to have the acting as if. That's the primary thing, because well, otherwise you're a hypocrite. The, the most famous philosopher of the as if is Immanuel Kant of the 18th century. I mean, just a, a, the great kind of father of the Enlightenment. And he's often thought uh, to be somebody who, who does away with God. He, he's a kind of precursor to Nietzsche in lots of ways. There was a, a poet called Heine who said that uh, Kant was much more devastating than Robespierre, because whereas Robespierre just uh, decapitated a, a, a king, Kant decapitated God. But I think hmm. he had this idea that you, you, we, can't, we can't know that God's, God exists, we can't have theoretical knowledge that God exists, but we must so conduct ourselves in the ethical life as if God exists. Because of We can't know that God exists, we can't prove that God exists, just act like God exists. But why is it just act like the Christian God exists? What, what makes this fictional being better than all the thousands of fictional beings that have been created throughout all of human history. As free beings, as, that's the primacy of pure practical reason. So, so we know its reality as free agents. So you could say in a way that Kant is not actually claiming that, I mean, I think Heine is completely wrong about this, but that, that, that it's, you know, 